All right. Hi, everybody. We are, thank you for your patience. We're going to get started here in just a second. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody. So we're here for the Enriching the USA Ecosystem Showcase for Tech for Good. Um, th we, this is set up as a Zoom meeting, so I just want to ask everyone to mute your microphone, um, if possible, um, just to make sure that there's no sound in the, in the background. We'll have a number of speakers speaking, so um, please go ahead and do that. So thank you all for joining today. Um, so just to kind of get started and say welcome and, and say who we are. So um, we are the all part of the Enrich in the USA uh, consortium, and so we're here today to, to showcase three different ecosystems that all have um, some particular activities in, in the range of tech for good, and we're going to um, give a lot of time for those particular ecosystems and then for some individual meetings afterwards um, with some of the selected entrepreneurs and the ecosystems themselves. But um, first, just for a quick introduction, so we're enriching the USA. Um, I'm Jack Henkel with NBIA. We also have uh, Blondine uh, Shintapai Kari. I probably mispronounced your name, Blondine. I apologize. Uh, no worry. From EAEC, Sebastian Torre from EAEC, Val Lovada, also from NBIA, Boston, and then Claire Chen, who is within Cura for the Washington, D.C. Center. Um, and just a couple of quick housekeeping notes as we get started here. Um, uh, you can put questions at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom panel, or maybe the top, depending on your view. So feel free to type questions at any time throughout our panel. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end, so please do that, and we'll address the questions as quickly as we can, or as many questions as we can at the end. Um, and... Um, yeah, and then at the end, you'll see I'll talk through the agenda, but at the end, we're going to split into breakout rooms and have some entrepreneurs present to our ecosystem panelists today. So, um, yeah, with all that with all that said, please, we'll go ahead and get moving on here. Oh, one last note. This session is being recorded. Um, so just so you know, um, you're aware of that we are recording this and we, we um, will be posting the results. So just so everyone's aware. Um, Enriching the USA is funded by Horizon 2020. This is one of the, this is the biggest, European Research Innovation Program um, that enables a lot of great activities. Uh, one of our key goals with Enrich and with Horizon is removing barriers to innovation. Um, so we're, we're grateful for the ability to create this program through the Horizon 2020 program and the European Commission. Uh, there are nine consortium partners all involved with this project. Um, you can see them all on the screen here. They're from both the US and, um, and Europe. And we have a number of partners from these organizations on the call today. Um, and I'll have contact information at the end, so feel free to, to reach out to, to all of us, uh, to any of us and all of us um, after today. Um, Enrich stands for the European Network of Research and Innovation Centers and hubs in the USA. So there's activities connecting European innovators with uh, soft landing and other opportunities in the US. Um, with NBA, I'm located in the US, EAC is in the US and in Cura, and the rest of the partners are in Europe. Um, and Enrich in the USA is one of three Enrich activities. So there's also Enrich in Brazil and Enrich in China. Um, today's focus is Enrich in the USA, but there are other, uh, those other activities all funded through Horizon 2020. Uh, the goals of Enrich in the USA, um, so there's several, several important goals. So one is reinforcing innovation um, in commercialization across the Atlantic. So how can we support promising innovations, and you see deep tech focus there, promising deep tech innovations from Europe um, into opportunities in the, in the US. Um, it's a very collaborative program, so creating programs and soft landing opportunities in the US um, that sort of cross borders and, and support innovators on both, um, both in the US and in Europe. And while this is a European, this is a Horizon 2020 program, the goal of the network is to be sustainable. So this network is being built from the ground up to be sustainable and live beyond the life of the program itself. So um, we're hoping Enrich is, will be around for a long time supporting European innovations. And of course, you know, there's a number of activities through Enrich. Um, a lot recently have been converted to virtual just because of the situation around the world with COVID-19. But uh, when travel is enabled again, we're hoping to, to combine the virtual with the in-person soft landing and other programs. Uh, to support innovation. So we're, we're building towards that as a future. Um, and just also another reminder here, Enrich uh, 
is not only for EU member states, but also for associated countries. So you see a list on the screen. So there's a wide range of uh, countries that are eligible where participants can take part in Enrich from across Europe. Um, so it's not, again, not just the EU member states. Um, and it's for a range of stakeholders in different ecosystems. So these are researchers, entrepreneurs, SMEs, R&D institutes and labs, universities and clusters. So um, there's programs through Enrich and activities in Enrich that target different, some of these different innovators in these different groups. And so um, uh, you'll see a list of some of the future activities um, and kind of see, you'll see some of the split there, but there's activities for a wide range of stakeholders um, in Europe to support innovation coming into the US. Um, just at a high level, the journey that we see for European innovators through the Enrich program is obviously the first is just learning about the market, um, the research landscape, um, and kind of understanding what the opportunities exist. Step two is exploring, learning how to explore those opportunities in the US, whether it's a research innovation landscape, that's networking, these can happen uh, virtually like we're doing here or in person again, once travel is, um, is a bit more possible with the situation going on. Um, three is as you move through the pipeline is receiving more in-depth mentoring and training and, and soft landing opportunities directly here in the US. And so that's, um, that's mm -hmm. the, the third part. And then obviously growing, we wanna help all the companies that participate in Rich find money for the research, commercialize their technologies or engage in business development opportunities. So there's this continuum of learning about the opportunities and then there's parts with Enrich all along the way to help companies move through that pipeline in that pathway. And so part of today is, is helping to promote and understand some of these ecosystems, particularly in the tech for good space. Um, and so we're, we're along the first part of this continuum here, but uh, the hope is that a lot of the companies participating can move into some of the later parts here as we move forward. Um, so just the red centers highlighted are all participating in today. So these are the three ecosystems in today's program. So in Boston, San Francisco, Washington, DC, we're obviously building a, building a network of other additional landing hubs throughout the US that'll be um, that European innovators and researchers can tap into and tie into um, for some of the longer term support along with the centers. But um, the centers are leading a lot of the activities that are coming out of the hubs and throughout the US. And so this is the sort of just a high level structure of what the Enrich program looks like. Uh, I mentioned there's a number of other events that have, we've all, we've been either transitioning in-person events to virtual or creating new events to kind of respond to some of the situation happening right now. And so um, there's a number of events, three ecosystem showcase series. This is the first one. Um, there's also events focused on ed tech, on healthcare, and the coronavirus specifically. So you can see the list here of all the events happening between now and the end of the year. These are also on the Enrich website. So if you go to the website listed there, um, and we'll make the slides and the website available to everybody. But if you go to that site and then go to opportunities, that opportunities or events, they'll show the different uh, opportunities listed on the Enrich website with all the details about how do you apply and uh, what each program will look like. Um, and I think many of you are registered for the Smart City Ecosystem Showcase series, but definitely make sure to look at um, everything else listed here. Great, so this is just kind of a quick rundown of what today is gonna look like. Right now we're doing our introduction, um, kind of briefly talking about Enrich. And then next we're gonna move on to our ecosystems and, and they'll present. So the way this will be structured, we have three questions for each ecosystem. Um, and there's one person from each of our, um, one great representative from all of our ecosystems that will answer each question. And these are about opportunities for European entrepreneurs, opportunities within each of the ecosystems. Um, so we're gonna learn a lot. Um, I would ask you to, again, please uh, type in your questions at any time throughout the whole session. We'll keep track of them and monitor them in the chat. Um, so just put your questions right in the chat, in the chat box. Um, we will take questions at the end and we'll present them to our panel. Um, uh, but yeah, please list them at any time um, in the chat feature there. And I'll send out some reminders throughout the sessions. Um, and then once all our, our reverse pitch and our session presentations are over, we're gonna move into breakout rooms. And so we've selected, um, if your uh, entrepreneur has been selected to present, uh, you've been notified and we should have your slides and all your details there. So what we'll do is we'll move into different breakout rooms where everyone from the, our Boston ecosystem is in one room, from San Francisco and DC are in separate rooms and we'll be uh, placing the entrepreneurs in the right rooms. 
um, for the presentation. So wait until your time to present to share your screen, but we'll be here to help with any kind of technical issues that you have. Um, if you're presenting in two different rooms, then uh, you'll hear from me and I'll kind of move you to the room when it's time for you to present or about 15 minutes before it's time for you to present to your second presentation. So, um, and so that those breakout rooms will last about an hour and 45 minutes and that will conclude our day. So, um, and if you have any questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat there. Um, I have the contact information from everyone here at Enrich. Um, although I will add, before we send slides out, I will add Claire's email. I apologize, Claire, I don't have your email in here, but we'll make sure to have everyone's contact information in here um, for Enrich. So um, with that, I am going to hand it over to Blondine to uh, manage Thank our you, presentations. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Hi, everybody. I'm Blandine Chantepicari, part of Enrich. I'm located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but for today's exercise, I'm uh, coordinating the DC ecosystem with my colleague Claire Chen uh, with Encura, who is actually in Washington, DC. So I resent in the chat the documents where you have all the companies, all the schedule. Um, if you have a, any questions, we will also uh, send uh, uh, use a biography of all the, the speakers uh, later today. Uh, okay, yes. So uh, we're gonna go question by questions. We have three questions and I'm gonna engage our uh, different speakers from the ecosystems. Uh, we, the idea to compare three ecosystems, it's not to compare, but to give you like a first, uh, a first taste of what's happening in Washington DC, in Boston and in San Francisco. Um, it is short, of course, we cannot go into details, but it's just to give you a taste and especially to prepare you uh, if you're gonna uh, pitch to them later. So one question, three answers for each question. The so first questions, and um, before I start reading it to you, I want to make sure Jack is uploading Barry's slides for that. So the first question is, how um, do you help international startup, small businesses, minority businesses um, to, into your ecosystems? So we're gonna start with Washington DC and and Barry, and Barry, please introduce yourself. I'm not, and with all your titles as well. Um, um, so Barry, why DC, what do you do uh, for startups, especially uh, minority startups? Well, um, I am Barry Datloff uh, with the US Army Medical Research and Development Command in Fort Detrick, Maryland, which happens to be about uh, 50 miles from Washington DC, but I live closer. Um, I was intrigued that Boston, San Fran, and Washington are the uh, three places to look at because just yesterday I was uh, comparing those three in regards to what's different. And I think that's critical for international businesses to appreciate. I don't want to uh, boil it all the way down, but clearly Washington, D.C. has the largest concentration of government laboratories, including our own. Having lived in Boston and spent a lot of time in San Fran, uh, they've got the academia and the venture capital. Um, it's a very different type of ecosystem, and that's the reason for the presentation today. Washington is heavy on NIH, DOD, USDA, DOE, all the acronyms of the federal laboratory ecosystem. Because we both fund and we actually use our own technologies. It's uh, a real uh, ecosystem. We buy our own inventions. So I'll pop through the slides real quickly so that in essence, I'll be able to address all of these. You can go to the next slide. MRDC is the headquarters for all of the biomed activities out of the Army Futures Command. Uh, we're about uh, 2.6 billion in research funding worldwide and the areas that we work in are at the bottom. Many of the companies pitching today are of specific interest. Make sure that Stimit uh, contacts me afterwards just in case they uh, fall off at any point. Um, you'll also note that we have labs all over the world, and that's because uh, soldiers are deployed worldwide, 
and face some of the challenges from a health perspective that the locals face. That actually is of tremendous value uh, to both European as well as any international partner. And we do clinical trials overseas in endemic regions for things like vaccines and therapeutics. Next slide. So our primary areas are vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, and medical IT, which basically means anything that will keep the warfighter safe. These all have dual use applications. These are all in the benefit of public health. And some of them are country specific because of schistosomiasis not being a problem in the US, but a problem in other countries. And so we try to focus on anything, anywhere that poses a threat to the health of a warfighter. Next slide. We have a concept which is beyond uh, just licensing technologies to companies, and we get approached by many of you uh, for how to get in the door to DOD. And we appreciate that because you may have a technology that is all ready to purchase. We call that fielding a uh, technology. But we also have a lot of companies who need R&D collaborations, funding, the ability to produce mock-ups, test them in the field, even take them uh, to the FDA. Um, licensing is our personal bread and butter out of Fort Detrick, but the true goal of Assistive T2 is to field a product, not to get a patent, not to get a royalty. Next slide. So our ecosystem in this geography, which I hope is summarized here, is that we try to really bridge companies from public financing over to private financing. And in collaboration with the state of Maryland, in collaboration with a tremendous number of other federal entities, there's a lot of seed money available. And the goal is really to get that bridge and not let somebody fall off into the valley of death. Uh, we have a sheet for a long list of biomedical federal funding. Um, but as you can see on this uh, already, too many acronyms. And uh, especially in other languages, uh, just get used to the fact that you're going to need a acronym guide. I have one if anybody needs it, by the way. Next slide. And that may well be the last. So I'll, I'll stop there, subject to your questions, Blondine. Thank you so much, Barry. So of course, you don't need to be in greater Washington DC to work with DOD, but as Barry mentioned quickly, and as you will hear later, uh, there are some funding when you're in that area, and then we'll present about it later. So now you're gonna have a taste of San Francisco ecosystem, and I would, uh, I would like to invite Ron uh, to, to join us. Uh, Ron, just overall, uh, how you and how San Francisco is help, helping uh, the, the startup, and especially, you know, the, the smaller, the international small, uh, startups, uh, minority, minority owned businesses. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about, um, about your ecosystem? And either, Ron, are you here? I don't see you. You were there earlier. Yeah, we don't hear you. Perfect. Um, Sebastian or Jack, could you put up his slide? If not, Ron, could you put up your slide? Sorry about that. I can share my slides if you prefer. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, just give me one second. And slideshow. Uh, start from start. Here we go. So um, thank you, Blondine. So my name is Ron Morris, and I'm the director of uh, Insect U San Francisco. And um, I will definitely get to the ecosystem itself. I'll, I'll start just a little bit about who we are. And um, so we opened a campus in January of 2016 um, to support our consortium of schools, 16 schools, 25,000 students uh, in Europe, mainly in France, but also in Monaco, Geneva, uh, with satellite campuses in Shanghai, London, and most recently in San Francisco. So basically our uh, idea was that we need to bring more innovation and entrepreneurship skills to our students. So San Francisco was an obvious fit for us. 
and we receive between five and 600 students per year. Um, and uh, one of the things that is, uh, uh, that is important is that we're very much hands-on. We, we have what we call the challenge-based uh, university approach. So students don't come to, um, to prepare for exams. Students come to work on projects. So we have a number of uh, very impactful projects. One is called Startup Factory, in which uh, students come with their startup projects and get accelerated in San Francisco. The other thing that we're very excited about, because you know we're, we're talking about a consortium of uh, francophone schools, but we're not only interested in Europe. Uh, about 25% of our participants are coming from Africa and they're at the MBA level. So they're coming from government, from uh, industry, and from startups. And they're coming to San Francisco um, for, to get the tools and to get the methodology to drive their innovation in entrepreneurship projects. So we, uh, we work in, uh, with programs from anywhere from one to 10 weeks. And this is a quick look at our uh, approach, which is uh, at the center of it all, as I said before, it's inductive learning. It's learning by doing, it is working on projects. And uh, so quick view, we are in downtown San Francisco. Um, and, uh, to, your, to your question, Blondine, about the ecosystem and how it works, it's very much important that we, uh, that we fully embrace the startup mantra of San Francisco, which is get out of the building. And we do that all of the time with uh, partners in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco. Um, so taking uh, our participants for um, inspirational talks and visits with local experts um, in, the, in the ecosystem. Um, anywhere from startups, that's a, our design thinking instructor, but also works uh, in a Silicon Valley startup. And uh, introducing our participants to, yeah, to the local experts to engage. It's also very important for us to be not only asking to receive from the ecosystem, but to, to, to give back into, we do that uh, by hosting events. Uh, we uh, worked with Voice of America in the um, in Silicon Valley, uh, sorry, the African Technology uh, Foundation to host events. This was for a premiere of a film that was produced by Voice of America and African Technology Foundation. Um, in, uh, back in the good old days where we could actually host people on our campus, and we're very much looking forward to getting back to that, uh, to getting back to that um, reality. Uh, we hosted for local companies, uh, including Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi, and, um, and EDF, uh, the French uh, electricity company. We hosted something called Innovation Days, and we were focusing on micromobility. Um, not to mention the fact that uh, uh, we, uh, we have had the opportunity to host Enrich, both for meetings and for events on our campus. And we're very excited about that match because it seems as though, um, you know, we have something to both contribute and to benefit from that relationship. So that Thank was you, Ron. a quick look, <laughs> quick you, look at what we're, we're doing in San Francisco. Thank you, Ron. So now uh, we're, we're going to have a, a little taste of the ecosystem uh, of Boston. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I yeah, think we have, uh, we, have to, to... we have Thomas uh, okay, here. Sure, go ahead. That was uh, going to complement that answer. So Thomas Simonet from Bank of the West, want to make sure that uh, he can introduce himself. He doesn't have slides, but uh, very important for the ecosystem, really for Europeans coming to the U.S. Uh, with uh, uh, trying to find a bank, trying to find a, a way to manage uh, uh, their cash flow. Um, so an, an important player. So I wanted Thomas to have a, a one or two minutes. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Sebastian. Thank you, uh, Blandin, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to talk uh, to be to be here and uh, talk about how an international bank as a BNP Paribas can help uh, startups to uh, move into the U.S. and develop and grow their their business. So, just quickly, you know, probably BNP Paribas is a big and important player in the in the world. Uh, in the U.S., BNP Paribas is represented by Bank of the West. 
for the universal banking part. I mean retail, uh, wealth management, corporate, and it's exactly uh, how uh, we can uh, support uh, uh, your business to uh, to be uh, uh, set up in the US. So we are covering uh, 22 states, um, roughly the west of the, uh, uh, the US and uh, some point in the, uh, in, uh, in the east coast. Um, we are really connected um, with uh, our uh, uh, ecosystem. We talk about ecosystem and it's very important for a bank to uh, support uh, you, to connect you, to understand the culture and help you to, uh, uh, to set up your finance uh, here, uh, uh, align and um, um, uh, yes, uh, align with uh, uh, the overall strategy of the group. Uh, you are a client in France or you are a prospect in France, you would like to set up your business in, in the US. We have connection, we have the bridge that will permit you to, uh, to engage uh, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with your finance here. And uh, 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 over, uh, um, in addition of that, uh, we develop a lot of partnership to bring you uh, uh, into this ecosystem. Uh, um, aside uh, Enrich, aside of all these uh, partners, we develop uh, uh, as well a, a connection uh, with a platform, a crowdfunding platform like uh, Ulul. Uh, and uh, when you talk about specifically uh, how we uh, uh, help uh, these communities, for, for example, for women entrepreneurs or for impact uh, uh, projects, uh, we develop this kind of partner partnership with a crowdfunding platform, uh, with uh, um, uh, networks, uh, business networks like French founders or uh, um, the NASDAQ entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial centers. And uh, as we are a bank, we help as well with uh, funding. Uh, we develop digital tools uh, to help you to uh, uh, apply for loans. Uh, we recently uh, uh, um, launched uh, our uh, uh, digital uh, express loan, uh, uh, 10 minutes for yes, 48 hours for funding. So yes, <laughs> check it out, uh, that, that is possible. And uh, uh, with uh, all what is happening with the COVID-19, uh, uh, digitalization is a really a key part of, uh, of the development of a bank to support the client and specifically the people who are moving uh, uh, internationally. And uh, quickly uh, to finish, uh, uh, Sébastien, uh, behind each uh, company there is an uh, uh, individual, there is a uh, founder. Uh, we are here as well to support uh, uh, the family, the individuals. When you are jumping in another country, I did that and uh, many of us did that uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, it's a big challenge. So you should uh, have uh, a support of a partner uh, on all the needs that uh, we, you will and, uh, and to face all the issues that you will, uh, you will have. And uh, uh, banking should not be an issue. You are here to develop your business. You should have a, culture, a bank who, who understand culture, who understand your needs and who can help you. So many things that are done by Bank of the West uh, with this partnership, with a, a specific offer services, and we will be glad to, uh, to welcome you and guide you in this uh, uh, new ecosystem uh, when you arrive, San Francisco or other parts uh, in the US. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. So, I would like to invite uh, the ecosystem of Boston and especially Ryan, but uh, if, uh, if Julian or Val wants to, to participate as well, so to answer to that, uh, to that first question. So, I'm going to repeat it. How do you help international startups, especially in tech for good and underserved populations in Boston? So, tell us a little bit about that, Ryan. Well, no, we'll start with Julian. Oh, you will start. You will start with okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. I'm Julianne Zimmerman with Reinventure Capital here in the Boston area, and um, Val asked me to to give this quick response. Um, I think because in many respects, I'm sort of indicative of the community here. So. I'm a managing director with a, a venture practice, and, and our practice specifically focuses on uh, companies led and controlled by black, indigenous, and other persons of color, or women of all identities as the founders. Uh, and we look at companies specifically that are um, based here in the US. They don't have to have started in the US, but they have to be based here in the US and, and growing profitably. 
But in addition to my work as a, as a venture capitalist, specifically an impact investor, I'm also an instructor at Tufts University and, and a participant in the MIT Venture Mentoring Service and a judge for lots of our local competitions, which are world famous. And, and that is sort of indicative of the nature of the ecosystem here in Boston. Um, in addition to the universities and hospitals and corporations who are your potential partners, customers, and, and strategic investors, um, we also have a significant number of, again, world famous accelerators, incubators, and competitions, mass challenge among them, for example. And, um, and a significant representation of, of communities, whether those are physical communities, work, uh, shared workspaces like um, Greentown Labs, where, where Ryan is based, or virtual communities focused on um, both sector-specific uh, um, professional networking, like, for example, Mass Bio, which is obviously focused on, on biotech-related companies, or other groups focused on other sectors, whether those are robotics or, um, or other technologies. Um, and then we also have um, a handful of communities that are, are specifically focused on immigrant founders. We have venture practices like One Way and Unshackled specifically focused on, on immigrant founded companies. We have the Immigrant Entrepreneur of the Year Awards for which I've been privileged to serve as a judge for the past several years. And it's my favorite event of the entire calendar year. And um, specifically with regard to Tech for Good, in addition to Greentown Labs, which you'll hear about later, we also have Impact Hub Boston and several other communities where you will find um, significant concentrations of founders who are leading uh, purpose-driven companies. Um, some of them are for-profit, some of them are non-profit, some of them are hybrid. Um, they span uh, every possible impact sector you can imagine. And um, there are, I would say, um, for, for every stage of venture in the Boston area, there are um, readily existing communities um, waiting for you to join them. I would also encourage you to um, connect with the consular representatives here in the Boston area. Um, we have several significant uh, consular outposts in the Boston area, uh, among them, for example, Swiss Next Boston, which is an extremely active community. And um, and you'll find that, that those are also enormously helpful in getting landed here in Boston and growing your footprint in the States from here. Thank you, Julianne. It was a very you know, good overview uh, of all what's happening in Boston. I really appreciate it. So we're going to move to the second questions. And we're going to start with Ryan, actually. We're going uh, to go uh, Boston first. So our second question for Ryan, but also Val or Julian if they want to, to intervene, it's what are the incentives, the funding, the, pilot, the opportunities to launch a pilot uh, in Boston and that are available, funding that are available for immigrants, especially our European uh, companies. Also anything special we should know uh, concerning COVID. So uh, from past experience, from current, could you tell us, Ryan, a little bit and tell us more about you as well? I would be glad to do so. Um, great to be with everybody and so nice to follow Julianne, who uh, I think it uh, speaks a lot of the Boston ecosystem that I'm talking right after her. She is one of my favorite people uh, in, all of, uh, in all of the Boston uh, early stage investing community and someone who I've collaborated with for a number of years. Um, I'm the executive vice president and general counsel at Greentown Labs. Greentown Labs is the largest clean tech incubator in North America. Uh, we have a 100,000 square foot campus 
that is located right between uh, Harvard and MIT, very convenient location, uh, just across the border of Cambridge and Somerville. Uh, that 100,000 square foot campus includes co-working space, uh, prototyping laboratory space, uh, biological uh, uh, safety level two wet laboratory, uh, as well as a myriad of member resources that we deploy to support over 100 startups that are located at our Somerville campus. Uh, to date, Greentown Labs, which is uh, going to celebrate its 10th anniversary next year, has incubated startups that have collectively raised over $850 million. Um, so it's a great community of clean tech startups. Um, the beauty of the ecosystem, I think, to build on, on what Julianne touched on, is that there are so, it's, it, it's a diverse set of stakeholders that provide so many different yet very critical resources to early stage companies. So first and foremost, you talk about the people. Uh, we have an incredible uh, uh, group of engineers, of entrepreneurs, of investors who come out of the research universities that are based here uh, and provide really great uh, people uh, to help power your companies. We have an uh, uh, I, I would say next to the Bay Area, probably the most robust early stage investing community in the country, um, very focused on angel and seed investing and provides a lot of that early stage capital for companies to grow. Um, in addition to both the human capital and the financial capital, the resources in the Boston area are incredibly meaningful. And take, for example, the resources we have at Greentown Labs. So um, for the companies who incubate there, in addition to getting access to the prototyping space or the wet laboratory, if they are building something of physical nature as a company, they can access our machine shop, electronics lab, 3D printing laboratories, rooftop laboratory, uh, use our building as it's a, a living experiment uh, and, and use all of these resources to uh, focus on developing their technology. Um, the beauty of having an ecosystem like this in place with all of these resources, whether it's the physical resources or some of those um, uh, more intangible resources like the accelerator programs and the mentorship that's available, is that it allows the startups and the entrepreneurs to focus on the actual technology development. If we remove all the other obstacles that are in place for technology development and allow the startups to focus on that, they're going to get farther along and they're going to do it with less capital. And it ultimately gives them the opportunity. And this is where I think uh, Boston is most meaningful to founders and early stage entrepreneurs that are coming from Europe. Uh, once that technology development is far enough along, it gives entrepreneurs the opportunity to focus on commercialization. Boston is a great beachhead market for European companies to come to the United States, raise additional capital because of the robust venture capital ecosystem that is here and commercialize their technologies. And so at Greentown Labs, we not only have this great set of resources, great space and great connections with the local investment community who's deeply committed to supporting clean tech entrepreneurs. We also have a collection of over 50 uh, corporate partners and those corporate partners are coming to Greentown Labs to complete scouting activities, to make investments, to find companies to license or pilot their technology, and to ultimately be pioneering customers for their clean tech, uh, for these clean tech companies. The dirty little secret of clean tech is most of it is B2B, business to business. So the ability to have corporate partners that are not just talking the talk on carbon neutrality, but are making meaningful steps towards reaching carbon neutrality by investing in the companies that are going to make that happen is so important. And so we have this beautiful opportunity here in, in, in the Boston ecosystem to bring companies over from Europe, help support them with the talent, help support them with the capital and the resources, and a great network of corporate partners that are gonna really help them focus on commercialization, which is the goal, access the US market, uh, one of the biggest markets in the US, uh, and one that's more lightly regulated uh, than European markets. So there is, I think, more freedom to innovate uh, and, and think about how you wanna commercialize your technology.
And the, the result of all of that for our companies is that we, we have incubated a number of European companies. Uh, we have a number of great partners and advisory board members, uh, including Inno Energy. Uh, and we, we work on regular events uh, with uh, some of the consulates, uh, including the Dutch consulate uh, and the British uh, consulate that uh, Julianne mentioned earlier. So it's a wonderful ecosystem, which we're proud to support and, and glad to connect with everybody today. And specifically when it comes to COVID-19, I'll say this very briefly, uh, it has been a challenge unlike any other here in the Boston area. We were one of the hardest hit, but have also navigated it in a way much similar to, I think, the results you've seen in Europe. Uh, so we are now open. Uh, Greentown Labs is open. Our member companies are there on a daily basis, both working in the labs and at their desks, albeit following uh, very strict safety precautions. And we are very committed to keeping those safety precautions in, in place and allowing our member companies to continue to advance their technologies. Uh, they're all on timelines, uh, tick tock, tick tock of that capital burn. Uh, and, and so we want to do everything we can and are committed to do everything we can to support them with all the safety precautions we possibly can provide so that they can continue to innovate through COVID-19. So thanks. Thank you, everybody. Ryan. Thank you so much. So, wow, what a pitch. So now it will be interesting to have the answer of San Francisco. What about San Francisco? What's happening there? What are the incentives, how we can launch a pilot in, in San Francisco, especially in tech for good? So, uh, Sebastian, I, I invite you to coordinate uh, and, you know, all our speakers from San Francisco to answer a bit. What are the incentives? What are available for Europeans? Um, and what's happening with, with COVID, especially in the tech for good uh, industries. So I was thinking of Esan uh, could maybe take the lead on this uh, question. Um, are you are you here, Ethan? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Ethan. And you definitely yeah. can present yourself. Uh, a lot to talk about. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ethan. I'm the um, program manager at Hacks in San Francisco. So Hacks is focused on investing and accelerating early stage hardware companies. So we do a lot with, um, with robotics, with healthcare devices, with IoT devices, and some consumer devices, but um, essentially all hardware with a software component. Um, so we come in at the early stage and help companies with the prototyping uh, both here in San Francisco and in our facilities in China. So um, I might have a slightly uh, different perspective from some of our other uh, SF-based uh, presenters here today as a result of our uh, large presence in China. Um, but that is a compli complicated situation nowadays, as you as you would imagine, given the current um, given the current uh, world climate environment uh, in, in many regards. Um, so anyway, SF uh, is uh, the largest venture ecosystem um, for startups in the world. So obviously that is something that you would consider when you're thinking about interacting with and or coming to San Francisco. Um, there are investors at every stage um, from pre-seed like us all the way up to C and D. Um, and many of them are looking for uh, European startups to invest in, uh, but many of them um, also are, are not going to consider European startups from the early stage. So if you're looking for um, investors at the early stage uh, of your company's life cycle in San Francisco and you're based in Europe, you need to um, do, your, do your own research to make sure that those investors are willing to make investments outside of the US because many of them are not comfortable investing in Europe uh, if you're an early stage company and would only come in at later stages. Um, so just a tip to do your diligence before you start reaching out to investors. Um, but if you're not thinking about um, coming here just for VC and you're curious to check out the ecosystem, there are other places um, that you can come as a, as a sort of landing pad. Um, there are a couple of people on the call today, like Ron, where you can go and, and take a course at his school to, to get connected to the ecosystem and see what's happening here before you fully dive in and, and commit to moving here. Um, there's places like uh, Circuit Launch, which is a, uh, a, an incubator slash makerspace in Oakland, where you can come, gain expertise, work on your products, um, and get connected. 
so there are any number of resources similar to similar to Boston, you know, from accelerators to VCs, uh, where you can come and kind of get your get your feet underneath you. Uh, but um, I'll wrap up here. Um, with that said, it's not always completely necessary for startups to be in San Francisco. Um, I think there's a sort of uh, idea that uh, if you're a startup, you need to come to San Francisco if you're going to have a successful company. Um, sorry for the noise, street cleaner. Um, but that's not necessarily true. If you have customers based in Europe and you have capital in Europe, you don't necessarily need to be here. Most of our startups uh, that we invest in come and spend some time here, but we don't necessarily encourage them to stay here unless their investors require them to be here or if they have customers here in the Bay Area. So that's another thing to consider when you're thinking about um, moving to San Francisco or not. Ethan, I, I really appreciate that you're opening that discussion because, yeah, everybody wants the UD innovators to come to their ecosystem, but having that discussion, comparing, and, and uh, we're going to tackle a little, little bit that in, uh, in the questions. Um, now I would like some uh, Dan representing the archangels of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, to ge give us a little bit of taste of what's um, happening, you know, what are the funding opportunities in greater, in greater uh, uh, Washington, D.C. that's receiving a lot of uh, attention with, um, you know, Amazon coming in. So, uh, Dan, hi, thank you for joining us today and, and tell us uh, a little bit about the, the funding opportunities, especially for, for international companies. Well, good morning, good afternoon. How are you? What a group from everywhere here. Uh, yes, uh, we're down in D.C. We've uh, started our group here in about 2011. We got started with the help of a company out of um, Irvine, California called Intana Capital. And um, we, our original goal was to raise a fund in the D.C. area by contacting a lot of local uh, angels. Um, I can't see my face. Am I on here or not? There I am. Okay. Right. And so um, we pulled our, our Rolodexes, and over a period of about three or four years, we acquired roughly eight to nine hundred people in the area that invested at one time or another. Uh, all individual investors, unlike uh, Southern California, the people here uh, tend to be extremely independent-minded about how they put money into startup companies. And so we began to work individually, you know, company by company. We looked at several, I'd say at least 20, 30,000 companies through here. We are approaching a thousand companies that we have presented to the group. We have um, uh, learned a lot about the investment cycle. Uh, there's about an 18 month uh, new entry where we have a lot of new stuff coming on and then it grows and, and tapers and, and levels off and sometimes dies. We have, um, uh, since we don't take any over the trans uh, recommendations, all our recommendations come from people that we know personally who are investors. Uh, typically, most of the companies we see already have money in them. So we uh, have an extremely highly vetted deal flow here. And so uh, working with Blondine, we've, um, and also with, we have 169 uh, embassies here locally. And so we've uh, done a, a variety of international stuff, China, Poland, Argentina, Mexico, and we've even done stuff in California, for heaven's sake, okay? Uh, that was a good one. Uh, but the deal is, yes, yeah, all the way up to Philadelphia, we've done that as well. Uh, so we have a pretty good, pretty good reach here, and uh, our, our investors tend to be very footloose. They travel a lot. They bring us deals from all over, and so we take a look at them. And over a period of the time, that our, our cycle is that we say there's an initial personal interest in a company, and that money goes into the company with an individual. And then there's sort of a walking around period where uh, 
they put in 50, 100, 200 thousand dollars, and then see how that checks out. And then if there's a, a, a looks as though that the company is going to scale, then they go back to uh, their investor friends and colleagues that are either here or locally or somewhere else, and they raise the rest of the funds. So our funding range is uh, on an average around 200 thousand. We've had as high as a $3 million investment. We've had two IPOs. We've had a insanely high success rate. We have uh, some remarkable failures that we could talk about at some point in time. These are more, these are fun for some fun to talk about, but I will tell you, uh, when you go through a crash and burn, which is how it's, we were first in around here, it is not any fun. So crashes and burn are just part of the lesson. So we're really interested in working with Lundy. We have a very strong, uh, my business partner, Randy, who I think he should have been here. I talked to him earlier today. In fact, we were just talking to some of our contact folding uh, But in any case, uh, he, he gets done around, around quite a lot. Uh, he loves to travel. So we, uh, we here um, now have reinvented ourselves in the last uh, three months from a monthly meeting. We had gone through 110 consecutive monthly meetings here. And uh, now we're into we're going to virtual, and uh, and, it's, and it's, it's the thing I like about the virtual part is I get to meet so many people without having to get on a plane and fly five hours somewhere and uh, spend some time. It's really great. So, Lundin, thank you. I, I hope I've have I addressed some of the issues here. I I, I just started talking. No, thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, yes, Washington DC has been a good to even be an entry point for seed funding. And if the work you're doing is really welcoming a lot of international uh, companies and giving them a, a voice. So thank you, Dan. Uh, we're going to um, move to our last questions um, and uh, really to kind of position the three ecosystem in the tech for good, uh, in the tech for good industry. And I'm going to invite first uh, our colleague, Enrich colleague, uh, and you know, uh, expert Val Livada to to explain a little bit um, to explain a little bit, uh, Boston. What are the verticals in tech for goods that you're the strongest? Like uh, we had some hints, we had already uh, some examples, but uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit where you you excel the most? Uh, and sure. some stories, if you have some stories as well. <laughs> Thanks, Blandine. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm Val Lovata. I have been part of the Boston Innovation Entrepreneurial Ecosystem for close to 40 years now. We had a lot of different hats, one of them being the representative of Enrich in, uh, for the Boston Center. Um, and um, I really appreciate the fact that uh, Julianne and Ryan have been my co-conspirators here in explaining the Boston ecosystem. I will probably repeat some of the things that they've said, but I want to give you kind of a quick overview of, of Boston. Um, about a, two weeks ago, um, this uh, Bloomberg Index um, ranked uh, Massachusetts uh, and actually Boston because we are the the center of innovation in Massachusetts as the number two most innovative uh, state in the country behind California and there's good news and there's bad news and that one is uh, good news is that we're second and we're very small compared to California and a lot of other areas in the U.S. Uh, the bad news is that three years ago we were number one, so something happened and we slipped a bit. But uh, Boston is really one of the most uh, important innovation and entrepreneurial centers in the country. And uh, that, uh, the reason for that is that we, uh, we preach and we operate something that I call collaborative innovation. Um, and uh, the, key, the key components of collaborative innovations uh, is, is the very close relationships and working uh, relationships between sources of technology development, uh, research. Um, these days, mostly university, research universities are the centers of that. Uh, established companies and emerging companies. And those three in the Boston area work incredibly well hand in hand 
supported by a whole bunch of things of infrastructure, capital, policy, and so on. Um, at the university level, and I think that this is one of the more unique sizes of, of Boston, is the number of uh, world-ranked research universities that we have in this area. Uh, on a population of, uh, of about 3 million of the greater Boston area, about 10% are students were, um, studying at various universities. Uh, including MIT, Harvard, Boston University, Boston College, Northeastern, UMass, Tufts, you name it. Um, and these universities are really right now doing some of the best research that is, uh, and also have gotten very good at spinning out a lot of that research. Uh, the other important component that it's, uh, again, somewhat unique to Boston, but it, it happens in San Francisco and other places, but what we have here uh, is, a, is a very large representation of uh, global companies in various sectors, market sectors. But the people that are mostly here in the Boston area for those companies are people that are involved with things like corporate venture capital, open innovation, tech scouting. They are the people that are looking externally for new uh, and interesting technologies that are emerging. Um, a very crude count with there are about 70 different or more companies, global companies. They have people on the ground here in the Boston area, very active, very engaged in that. Um, so the, this partnership between the research universities, the corporates, and uh, as a result, the spin-out companies uh, is supported greatly by the infrastructure. And, uh, you know, Ryan gave you a good sense of Greentown Labs, but there are four or five very interesting incubators, accelerators, or whatever you want to call them in the Boston area that are, are quite interesting. Uh, Greentown is one of them, Mass Robotics for Robotics, Cent Lab Central for Bio and Pharma, um, and the uh, CIC, the Cambridge Innovation Center for Digital, all these, uh, and, and the MIT engine, um, all of these uh, places have developed uh, this unique combination of startups, uh, global companies, and universities all working under one roof. And uh, the interaction um, is amazing in those places. There are a number of uh, other incubators and accelerators around the, the state and in the Boston area that are more typical of co-working spaces and have, some of them have focus on various verticals, but these four or five um, are very unique environments. And I think that this is uh, very critical to um, how well innovation and entrepreneurship works in Boston. Uh, we certainly have a good amount of venture capital. Uh, we com compete with New York for second place behind uh, California. Uh, and we also have an enormous number of mentors and service providers that help a great deal take the burden of, uh, as, as Ryan has said, of the technology developers uh, and the business burdens and the uh, uh, lift that and make life easier for them. As far as verticals in this area, we tend to be very heavy on hard tech, what we call hard tech, um, physical sciences, uh, the development of the Boston ecosystem started with microelectronics and computers. It added the big, big uh, area of biotech and pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have advanced materials and clean tech, more recently, ag tech and robotics. Um, so what you're looking at, and you probably can't see it very clearly, but uh, it's, uh, it's an aerial photograph or probably the highest density area anywhere in the world of innovation entrepreneurship. It's uh, in Cambridge across the river from Boston and the forefront is the campus of MIT and the research labs at MIT in yellow. And behind it, if you look closely, and I think you'll get this, uh, this uh, slide, 
you'll see a combination of large companies, small companies, other research centers, incubators, uh, you name it. Um, anything from uh, Toyota to J Johnson & Johnson to Draper Labs and so on. That's what creates the, the real power of the local community. Um, and the final thing I'll say is um, we're a small city in the United States. Boston is very small, 3 million people by American standards. Um, and most Europeans that I've known, and I've known a whole lot of them, uh, find it very friendly and comfortable. It's the most European city in the U.S. So thank, thank you, people. thank you so much. Well, sorry, uh, sorry. I want to to make I'm sure finished. we can <laughs> um, to make sure because uh, that we stay on schedule for the for the pitch. So now I want to invite uh, Mar, uh, who is going to introduce as uh, actually the university ecosystem in the Silicon Valley and especially what you're doing at Citrus because it's in in tech for good. You're one of the leaders. So tell us a little bit more about how the Silicon Valley and San Francisco is positioning itself uh, in which verticals in tech for good. Okay, so thank you. I always forget to unmute myself before I talk. So um, my name is Maher Hakim. I am the executive director of University of California Foundry, which is the University of California at Berkeley um, Innovation Hub on campus. And what we do is we support students, graduate students, undergraduates, faculty members, alumni of UC Berkeley ecosystem, as well as five Northern California UC systems in basically incubating their innovation and, and go to market strategy. Um, I, I think I will start by just, uh, just briefly talking about, um, so I've lived in, personally, I've lived in the San Francisco area for over 25 years. I am a tech entrepreneur myself. I started my career um, after I finished my PhD. I decided 1993-94 was the time where the information technology boom has started. So I found myself in San Francisco and over a period of 18 years, I built a number of, of uh, um, startup companies. Some of them were very successful, some of them were not very successful, but I'm very familiar with the, with the San Francisco ecosystem. And the one thing that I would say that makes the Bay Area unique, um, for me, at least, it's very clear. If you think about innovation itself, innovation is all about, you know, something new and useful, right? So it's all about a creation of something new. So if you look at behind innovation, the most important elements of enabling it is the people who created, the innovators. For you to create something new and useful, you yourself have to be thinking differently. What that means is that people who think differently and take risks are usually sort of outcasts in their traditional communities. So you're either the black sheep of your community or you're a member of the minority of your community. So what happens is over a period of maybe 50, 60 years, San Francisco, the Bay Area, encouraged all of these black sheep around the world, not just around the world, around the country, to come to San Francisco. So San Francisco has an unfair advantage of the number of black sheep globally. Right? So anyone who thinks differently and, and are bold enough to take risks, who find themselves an outcast in their traditional community, whether in the U.S. or outside the U.S., are, are, are attracted to come to San Francisco because like-minded people exist there. And that gives San Francisco and the Bay Area an unfair advantage. So if you feel at home that people don't appreciate you, don't think like you, you will find a home in San Francisco just because you'll be interacting with people like you. And that's really the key driver for, in a few words, to what enabled San Francisco to attract the venture capitalists and to attract the universities and to attract the companies who are looking for innovators. And I think that's something completely unique. You ask people in San Francisco today where you were born from, 90% of people will say was not born in San Francisco. They were either immigrants or first generation immigrants or people who felt uncomfortable in the US and their homes in Iowa and Utah and other places who came to San Francisco. So that's one point I wanna make. Um, this actually translates to Berkeley and at UC Berkeley very easily. If you look at the composition of our student body at UC Berkeley, we have close to 14% international students, but 80% of our students are either first generation immigrants or sort of non-traditional Americans. So again, the, 
It's the Korean, it's the Chinese, it's the Japanese, it's the Mexicans, it's the, you know, all of them identify themselves different than, you know, multiple generations of Americans. That's not good or bad. It's just unique to San Francisco. And if you actually believe, like I do, that a, a, an ingredient to innovation is the diversity, San Francisco have managed to create that diversity at home. Now, let me talk about tech for good. For me, you, the question is around vertical. I can only see two verticals for tech for goods because I never ask any founder who's building technology, are you building technology for bad? They all claim it's for good. But there's a difference between founders who prioritize money making over good and founders who prioritize doing good over money making. And I'll give you a very simple example. Facebook today, arguably if you talk to Mark Zuckerberg or Google, they will never say I created this company to do bad things. They will always say I was motivated by doing good. But the minute they prioritize money making, they follow a path by which venture capital investments, public market, the growth of, of uh, revenue becomes the driver of the company. And therefore, it's the choice of the business model that determines whether you're in the first category or second category. Zuckerberg chose the business model that rely on revenue from marketing. And because of that, today, Facebook is suffering from fake news, from privacy questions, from all of these things, because the business model they chose led them to where they are today. Doing good was prioritized second, money was prioritized uh, one. On the other hand, you've got Wikipedia and the Khan Academy. They both product of San Francisco ecosystem, but you don't even, most of us don't even know the names of the founders because they prioritize making, doing good over making money. And they decided that the companies to survive have to be financially sustainable. In other words, they also have to find a way to fund their business. They also have to find a way for founders to feel comfortable living. You know, the, the, the Khan Academy CEO and founder makes half a million dollars a year. It's nothing to, you know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's very good, healthy living, but he's not a multi-billionaire, right? So, it's really about the founding intent, the founding team and the founder's intention and what they prioritize for that determines not only which bucket they want to be in and also how they're going to build and grow their company. Because if you want to prioritize money, then of course you follow the VC track. Of course you try to build a business model that grows your financial revenue and profit. Of course you're going to start being bragging about how much money you raise from VCs. But if you follow the second model, which is you are prioritizing good first and sustainability second, then your path for fundraising is different. You look for different kinds of investors. These people exist in the Silicon Valley, exist in the Bay Area. You follow a different business model and different way to build your company. You follow a different way to hire a management team. You follow a different path for how you personally will get satisfaction out of your venture and of your company completely different two companies, groups of companies, both of them do good. The difference is what you prioritize first. And I'll leave you with one thing. Just think about for a second, if Facebook exists today without the marketing revenue engine, if they chose a business model that doesn't rely on marketing, Facebook would still exist today as a company because it provides huge value. It will exist without all the problems that are facing Facebook today, but it will not be an IPO company with a hundred billion market value with a founder that is a multi-billionaire. It will be a very useful company like Wikipedia that provides social value across the world. The founders is living very comfortably, very successfully, but without all the challenges and the problems that are facing Facebook today in terms of fake news, privacy issues, and, and so forth. So, um, I think this is all I have. Thank you, Mara. It, it was a very, uh, very interesting positioning for uh, San Francisco and a good sum up. Thank you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite uh, Paula. Okay, so I, I don't know if pa Paula had some uh, issues to log in. It's not for, okay, it's for sure. Giselle, do you want to speak up and just give us a hint of as a university ecosystem, George Mason, and uh, innovation ecosystem in the greater DC area. Sure, but I, I believe Paula is on the phone, so she might be able to join. So uh, but if not, then I can read her notes. It's not a problem. 
Uh, Paula, if you're here, just, just answer, otherwise I'll just uh, do your part. Okay, all right, then let me uh, just uh, read her one second. One second, I need to... Um... Okay, so, uh, so for, first of all, I, uh, on behalf of Paula, I would like to thank Enrich for the opportunity to speak. Uh, we really look forward to this collaboration. Uh, George Mason University is in Northern Virginia, just a few miles from the nation's capital. It is an R1 institution and our proximity to the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and other federal agencies allows for close collaboration to bring research to business and people. As the largest public state university, we are expected to play a role not only in serving a diverse population of 38,000 students, but also to have an impact on the regional economy in Northern Virginia. Mason has built a presence across three campuses Three additional business incubators, which I run as, as the business incubator director, and six small business support offices with a staff of more than 100. Last year alone, Mason staff provided business and technical assistance to more than 10,000 small businesses and startups across Virginia. This includes support to small business tenants in three Mason partnered incubators and close to 150 tech entrepreneurs. Because of support from Mason staff, 700 companies won government contracts last year. And if that weren't enough, 150 faculty and students sought help and advice bringing new technologies to the market. In the last uh, past year, Mason staff put on about 350 business and entrepreneurial training events with over 4,000 attendees. And now during the COVID, time of COVID, our staff have helped sustain thousands of jobs in the Commonwealth through facilitating access for small business loan support. For COVID response, our BioHealth Institute has been actively involved in expanding testing capacity across the state. We have specialized institute that focuses on sustainability of our buildings and operations as well as other sustainable practices with national implications. And our new Digital Innovation Institute works across all disciplines to bring intelligence and services to many types of businesses. We are in the process of collaborating across multiple universities and public partners in the development of Northern Virginia Innovation District, leveraging Northern Virginia's assets that include a clean public transit system, several like-minded universities and exciting industry partners such as the new Amazon second headquarters and the new Microsoft presence. We look forward to our partnership with Enrich and to learn from its other partners on how to best succeed and develop this work. So these were, uh, these were Paula's notes. And I'm, uh, so just to explain a little bit who I am. So I'm the uh, business incubator director I oversee the three incubators in the DC area. Um, I have the advantage of being both European and American. I, uh, in the past, I used to work for Swiss University in uh, Lausanne, where I was yesterday. I'm currently in the south of France on vacation. So I can uh, bridge the gap between the US and, and Europe, having worked in both places. And I understand, uh, and I worked for a Swiss startup uh, before leaving to come back to the US. So this, so I really understand what this is all about. And then I can talk a little bit more about the uh, Mason Enterprise Center, the Mason Entrepreneurship Hub, a little bit later on when we are in our breakout sessions. Thank you, Giselle, so much. Um, as you could see uh, with our three ecosystems, university, university collaboration, universities collaborating among themselves are critical to build those uh, unique uh, places where, um, you know, we can, we can think differently, as Mara said. Uh, Sebastian, I know you, we have another guest that wants to speak, so I, yeah. I let him introduce him. Thank you, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Michael Fiss uh, um, is, uh, has been uh, working with us uh, or, or, you know, thinking about some collaborating avenues and uh, was very interested about what we were doing uh, during, uh, in those series and wanted to uh, help out or support 
So Michael Fish from the European Commission uh, Policy Officer for EU Invest. If you have uh, 20 seconds, uh, it would be the right time to introduce yourself. Yeah. And make sure you do. Thank you. Yes. Uh, he hello. Hello. Good afternoon from, from Luxembourg. Uh, thanks, uh, Sebastian, for inviting me today. So it's uh, the first time uh, today that I'm joining uh, this kind of event. So I find it very, very interesting. Um, we, I'm, I'm policy officer and in charge for database of um, projects of the EU. So it's, we have about 1,000 entrepreneurs stored. So the project is database is called European um, investment project portal and um, we, we have here uh, entrepreneurs uh, but also other let's say uh, public projects which are looking for finance private finance but also want to reach out uh, to to um, yeah to to other entities and um, make make also business uh, cooperation and uh, yes, the, I, I've seen today some, some really excellent uh, opportunities for our companies. And in the future, we'll, we will ask them to, to take part in the events and maybe also uh, bring forward and, and show their project there. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for coming and thank you for supporting us. Uh, I know that Ron wanted to give a 10 second uh, wrap up because uh, in San Francisco, everybody knows each other, like in Boston and DC. Uh, Ron has been working with Hax uh, a little and uh, with UC Berkeley. I think you had a comment, Ron. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Maher and, um, and what Ethan were saying, because um, for me, what really stands out for the uh, SF ecosystem is not only that people are very, very savvy, that they're very aware that it's not copy and paste for people coming from other countries, but their willingness to share. And um, I, I say that because I know we've been to Hacks a number of times and also Citrus Foundry. And I'll give you just one example. One of our students coming from Abidjan um, on Ivory Coast uh, was working with us and got all kinds of incredible feedback. And he, he was just blown away. He's like, why are they sharing all this information? He went back home and he's started a company using drone technology to help uh, local farmers in Africa. And he was, he's very savvy also about Europe. And he's like, I would never have seen this kind of openness, people sharing their contacts, people sharing their experience and their know-how. And so, I mean, that's something that's very exciting about San Francisco. Not only that, every, that there are so many savvy people that know all the different aspects about innovation and entrepreneurship, but they're actually willing to share. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ron. It's thank all you about so collaboration much. and openness. So thank you, uh, thank you. Now we have to move forward, I guess. Uh, to uh, the next uh, phase. Yes. Uh, so let, let me talk a bit about the next yeah. phase. We're going to be divided in three groups. You've received the, the schedule. Um, so the next companies pitching are uh, Genesis uh, with Boston. It will be room one. Uh, Up and Town, room two for San Francisco. And uh, all three for uh, room three with DC. So as you can see, we are running late. So all the schedule is postponed by 15 minutes, um, and we'll make sure to to keep uh, to keep that in place. I'm resharing to everybody to everyone's uh, the schedules that way. In case you have uh, you missed it earlier and you join later, you uh, see it. Thank you. It was our first time doing this format. Of course, it's always too short to, to present three ecosystems. It's to start the discussion. Uh, please send us feedbacks. Uh, we are going to have our next ecosystems uh, um, series on, uh, on July 28th on Smart City. So um, I'm going to let Jack, is there anything? People are going to be divided, right? Yeah, so just a note on how this will work. Uh, yes. We've set the breakout rooms for, uh, so all the entrepreneurs, if you're pitching to more than one room, the room you go into first will be the first presentation that you have. Um, if you're going to two different rooms, then you'll actually see me sort of jump into that room, and I'll send a quick chat to you, and then I'll move you to the next room about 15 minutes before your time. So yes. you might see me jump in and out of the rooms to move you around. Um, I'll give a, uh, so we have 15 minutes for each between the presentation and Q&A, so you'll see a message, I'll send a message with two minutes left remaining for each session, just to give you everybody a sense of the timing. Um, and then um, I'll move everyone into the rooms, and if you haven't been assigned to a room, if you're just sort of a spectator, 
I'll stay in the main room and, uh, and put you in the room real quickly as we get started. But, um, but for the companies presenting, you can feel free to start uh, once you do the introductions and get in your rooms. Just one thing, so we received most of your slides, but it's okay if you haven't sent it to us, you will have access to share your slides. The idea is you introduce yourself and then you're gonna receive feedback from the different ecosystems. Uh, our different speakers have received uh, an evaluation sheet. It's a, a Google Doc, a Google Excel Doc or Excel file for those who cannot use um, Google. Uh, so um, you will receive a kind of a note, a, a grade if you want, like uh, on, on different uh, aspect of your presentation. Uh, and the best pitch, the best presentation the per ecosystem will uh, get 500, uh, 500 euros. Uh, so hopefully that money will be a stipend for you to visit uh, the ecosystem would like to, and that we start engaging collaborations. So, um, so Jack, last, you, last yes. element, uh, so we're still looking for Roberto, Joshua, Salt and Vito. Uh, so that's the one, for example, that didn't upload their slides, but that we're uh, that registered themselves and just I'm still trying to find them. I don't know if they've been able to log in. Uh, if they are here, uh, please uh, order another name, for example. Uh, please uh, uh, put a note on the, in, the, uh, in the chat um, because uh, if not, we would uh, probably for the one we just uh, before them, we would uh, add maybe five minutes and have a a, a, a 10 minute pause, but so that for the lucky one, which is before them, if we don't see the one uh, coming okay. after, it would have probably had five more minutes. Just so, FYI. yeah, for first, you know, like Jack answered, like, uh, we're gonna be transferred, we're gonna be transferred to, to rooms, okay. and if, if, if you have issues, uh, Jack can put you back in the room. Thank you, Jack. Mm -hmm. Let's go, let's start.